L.A. and Babyface sold the company in 2000. L.A. moved to New York City to replace Clive Davis to work at Arista Records. I followed him up there, but it was a real toxic environment for me. And I had a new boss that I was reporting to. They were yelling all the time. He was very condescending, and I felt like I was getting overlooked. And I started experiencing anxiety for the first time. And that's the first time that I ever uttered the words, maybe I should just kill myself. Behind the mask. Two man, what's up, my dog? What's good, family? Hey, another day in paradise. I had to steal your line. Already you okay know. with that? I'm cool with it, man. Yeah, run with it. But th this is the reason why, because we have another special guest joining us today mm -hmm. in the month of May. Mm -hmm. We can't forget that out. But this guest has an extensive background, right? Music industry executive. Mm -hmm. That's the top. That's the pinnacle of the pinnacle. Depending on what your dreams want to be. Also marketing consultant. Mm -hmm. Author, mm -hmm. she's an author too, too. Okay. See how I put that together? <laughs> and last but not least, she's one of the toughest, relentless philanthropists that I've ever met in my life. And I'm glad to welcome her to the BTM Lounge, Shanti Shoestring Stars. Hey! What's happening? What's good? What What's good? Thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored. Well, you know. And it's special to be in the lounge. Yeah, it's in the lounge, man. You know, we had you on the schedule for last year, but I was like, you know what? We got to get her in the lounge. Yes. Period. And so, last year was still weird with the pandemic. Yeah, it was. Uh, this it, is good. It feels yeah. more like family. Most definitely. As we most are, definitely. so yeah. And we get some FaceTime, too. Absolutely, absolutely. And you you killing it, you know what I'm saying? Got the, the Gucci hat on and everything. It's called thing. a bad hair day. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw on one of my hats, you know, and make it do what it do. Uh, is that possible? It's all good. No so. doubt, no doubt. Well, welcome to the BTM podcast. And what we like to do is start off the show with a segment called This or That. Okay. I'm going to ask you one or the other and, okay. you know, uh -oh. put you on the spot real uh -oh. quick. And you got to answer right. this, you know what I mean? All right, okay. Well, obviously you have a love for sports and you have a passion for the music industry yes. with your history as well. Don't even. Mm -hmm. So this or that, what would you rather be? A CEO of a record label or an owner of a football team? Oof. Oh, them dirty birds. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your ATL Falcons. Well, I will say the owners got a lot of bread of those football teams. So I probably would want to be an owner at this stage in my life of a football team. But I got mad love for the music industry. Would you, uh, the Falcons would be your team? Yeah, of course. Ride or die. Even with the way they playing? Oh, man. I can curse them out, but you can't. <laughs> but, yeah. But we making changes. We'll be all right. You think so? It, we, 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 we're in the rebuilding phase. We rebuilding. We should have rebuilt after 2017, but that's another podcast for another I day. know. <laughs> that is another podcast. See, she knows her sports, though. That's a fact. That's so a fact. I got to ask you. Mm. You're from the A, right? Oh, yes. I, I, New Atlanta? I, I don't throw up borrow A's. I'm old Atlanta, baby. <laughs> Hashtag oh. old Atlanta. Okay. So, All the way. So what you like? Who who you down with? The old Atlanta or the new Atlanta? Oh, I mean, listen, I'm Auntie Shanti. You know, I, I ain't got no issues telling my age. I'm 51. I grew up, you know, the thing that was so dope about Atlanta is growing up in Southwest Atlanta, we ain't have a lot, but, like, your neighbor might be a principal or a civil rights leader or a mm. doctor or a lawyer, and these were black people. Like, I grew up around successful black people. So for me, achieving my dreams was never an issue. It was just figuring out how to get to that goal, you know? But I knew I always wanted to make something of myself because we, you know, Atlanta was just such a dope place to grow up in. And then music and culture now obviously has made it like the black mecca, but Atlanta's always been, you know, a great place. Can we curse on the show? Absolutely. Atlanta's yeah. always been the shit. Let me <laughs> always. Let me just say that. Always. I can't knock it. I can't knock it. You know, I, I say this all the time, being from New York, but when I came to Atlanta the first time in the 80s when my aunt was down here and my mom used to come down here, this, I was like, it's something about the A that's just dope, the vibe, the energy. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm here now. And I appreciate you saying that, but it's funny. When I first started working, I know we're going to talk about the labels I worked at and the artists, but when we would go to New York to do promo, 
They were like, man, get that country shit out of here. Yeah. Like, they called us country all day. Facts, facts. But no now, love. No love at first. With shit now. Now it's like. <laughs> they run the, run the airwaves down But here. even then, even like 1995, Puff and Bad Boy and all them started coming down here throwing mm-hmm. parties and stuff. So mm-hmm. they knew it was some sauce down here that they wanted to, See, to I, sip on. I, I used to like it because, you know, they used to like the New York accent. You know what I'm saying? The women used to like the accent and everything. So, you I ain't going to lie. I went to Syracuse. Let's be clear. So I yep. left Atlanta and went up top. <laughs> new house. And boy, some of my serious crushes uh-huh. was from New York when I was in college. I'll be trying to tell Spice. I was man. like, oh, I was like, but no, nah, y'all, they got the Tims you know and the what hats what and, you know what and the accent. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a thing. I just hate when you give this dude some credit on the show right now. He loves it. She's from the country, but she love me because I'm from New York. That's what 50 said, yo. <laughs> Didn't sound like that. <laughs> but no, nah, but to that point though. I truly believe you came you came up through the golden era. Oh, I did. And we a sure. couple of years apart from each other. But I consider myself and my time was during that era too. Absolutely. I think about Usher. I think about Outkast, TLC, Babyface. You worked with all of them. Yeah. Tony Braxton. T- yeah, Tony Braxton. Yeah. So like like what was that experience like though? P- take us behind the mask and, and let us know what was it like. So the first thing was I started interning my sophomore year at Syracuse. Like, I was a on-air disc jockey. I worked on a hip-hop show, and then I was working at Capitol Records. So when I graduated in 1993, I got hired at LaFace four months out of graduation. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was hired as promotions director making $30,000 a year. I thought I was rich back then. <laughs> and the very first record I worked was Players Ball. Because what a lot of people don't know is Class. Players Ball was on a Christmas album for LaFace. So a lot of the DJs was like, Man, what is this record? This, this is a dope little record. And a lot of the lyrics had like Christmas nuances in it if you go back and listen to the original version. So LA was like, since this record is getting so much traction, we're gonna make it the first single mm. from their actual debut album. And it was crazy. And I was taking 12 inches to the club, to the GC, you know. Taking the 12 inches. Wherever I needed to go. Club. Cause, you know, strip clubs always had good food. So yeah, I was I t- like, I, t- you I took know. 12 inches to the gentleman's club too. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> So, you know, I was taking it, you know, getting dances for the DJs or whatever, and just I lay back in the cut, eat some wings, and get my record played. And that's what I did. Dope. All throughout the South. Dope. But then you had some experiences with, with the New York artists too, right? You said you oh, were yeah. I mean, big pox. See, the... LaFace's um, sister company was Arista Records. Right. And right. so was Bad Boy, which is, you know, was Puff's mm-hmm. label. And so you had Biggie and Craig Mack and all those guys. And they became like family to us. We would do promo tours together and be on the same shows. And that's how I got cool with Big and all those guys. And the funny thing is, when I was in college, a friend of mine gave me a nickname, Shoestring. So mm-hmm. anytime I would see So that's Big, where the nickname came from. Yep, because it... it it was my on air name. I used to do like Shoestrings Hip Hop Tip or when I worked mm-hmm. on the hip hop show. So, like, when I would see Big, he would never call me Shanta. He'd be like, Shoestring, what up? <laughs> uh, if I see Goody Mob or Cass now, it, and I know, they'd be like, Shoestring. Shoestring is what yeah. Big Boy be calling me. Shoestring. 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 So, it just kind of stayed with me. But I mean, it was, and for me being a female, I want to say to any of the females listening that might be, you know, wanting to work either in music or sports, you know. You can still, like, be feminine and do your thing, but, you know, I always made sure that I let my work speak for itself Mm. so that the people respected me first. So Big and all of them would see how hard and outcast how hard I worked, and they had to respect me. So they wasn't coming at me, you know, with the dumb shit on the road. Right. And so it worked for me. And I loved every minute of it. I bet you did. And, you know, I I talked to Big the night before... He, actually, the night that he passed away, we were all at the Vibe party in L.A. Okay. And he was over in the cut because he had hurt his, his he was like walking with his a cane. Yeah, he had yeah. hurt his hip or his knee. And he was just kind of quiet. And But it was crazy because the atmosphere, like Puff and his crew and all of them were shouting, bad boy, bad boy. So it was getting, I'm like, wait a minute now, we still in Cali now. Y'all yeah. doing a little too much up here in here right now. And he was just laying in the cut, and we were about to go to our Outcast um, Platinum Party mm. that Queen Latifah was throwing for them at Roxbury. And Big was like, "Yo, don't worry, we coming over right after this." And next thing I know, he got shot. Mm. That's wild, man. I, I, yeah, I remember that that day. Well, the, the morning after when it happened, I was I think it was it was in college, 
uh, time of spring break. And yeah, that was a tough time in hip hop. And like I said, we were yeah. all like family, so it, it was tough on all of us. Yeah. I literally went to my hotel room, packed up all my stuff, and got on like the uh, next flight. And like, I was like, I, got, I can't stay here. I got to get out of here. So what was the evolution of hip hop like? I mean, obviously you've seen a lot yeah. um, from the 80s. And we're talking about, for me, it was Slick Rick, Big yeah, Daddy Kane, sure. Rakim. Those are some of the artists that I know mm -hmm. to now. But now Atlanta influences everything. Yeah. So what's that evolution of hip hop been like? Now, even for me as a kid growing up, you know, we used to listen to the AM radio station. Mm -hmm. And it used to be this club called the San Susi. And they would go live from the San Susi. And we would put our, you know, cassettes in and hit record. And we would listen to booty shake music. Mm. Which, you know, a lot of people know originated primarily in Miami. Miami. In Let me see you from the back. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> but then you had like MC Shadi, you know, all those kind of yeah. cats from Atlanta in the South. And well, he actually Shadi wasn't from Atlanta, but he moved to Atlanta. But we love booty shake music. Arby. Yeah, Kilo, all of that. Yep. Okay. Like all of that was the shit back in the hey, day when I was you young. You go to the hey, we go to the club. And if we you ain't sweating, and you we went to the skating rink. We used to be at the skating rink listening to all that. And I was in a dance group. Um, you know, we danced in talent shows around Atlanta. I did all the yeek. You ever seen this dude do it? I don't know. Oh my god. Listen. What? what? You can't geek like me. We, I know we ain't got enough space. But. We ain't got enough space, so I, I'll show you at the okay. next birthday party. Okay, it's on. Might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> he gets it popping. It's on. We went to Patchworks, uh, what was it, 20 anniversary? What was it for Patchwork? Yeah. And uh, It was the anniversary. Anniversary. Oh, and, no. um Curtis was getting up Curtis. Curtis, no, it was Curtis's birthday. birthday. I'm oh, tripping. Oh, his birthday. It was Curtis's I just, yeah, 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 birthday. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. But then the... the yeah, songs came on and, and Spikes was in there yeeting. Oh, okay. I got. I, I need, Is that, I need to see that footage. Yeet, yeet, yeet. I, I'm going to have to get that footage for you. I need to see that footage. I'm, I'm going to get it for you. But back to your question. I'm sorry. I digress. But seeing the evolution of booty shake music, right, to just Southern hip hop, whether it was, you know, Outkast, Goody Mob, and then, you know, Criss Cross obviously really set the tone, but they were a little bit more pop, you know, than just kind of straight Southern hip hop. But... The one thing I'll say about Atlanta, the Atlanta community and the music community, even when we were going from Booty Shake to Outkast, we always gave love to New York artists, mm. like or even artists like a Too Short from the Bay Area, mm. or A Ball and MJG, you know, all those type of artists. But nobody wanted to show us that love initially. So I did promotions, as I mentioned. So I was taking the Twelve Inches in a club, and so it was tough trying to break an artist like Outkast. Because it was a different kind of sound. It was live instrumentation. You know, you might hear gospel and bass, um, you know, blues and pop and rock, all types of influences in their music. And, of course, you know, just real southern drawl. And at first, people didn't know what to do with it. And they were like, what is this? But then the first market that really broke out um, for us and stood up for us was San Francisco. Mm. Um, and it was a guy... Uh, well, Sway, Sway in the Morning, who's on Sirius mm -hmm. X. Yep. So Sway and Tech were one of the first ones to support us. And then New York finally came around, um, but it took much longer. Yeah, like yeah. Flex and all them, like shout out to Flex, but Flex and them didn't really hear it at first. Yeah. South got something to say. Right. And right. I was actually at the Source Awards the Source Award. yeah. in 1995. It was me, Big Dre, and Mike, Michael Blue Williams, who was outcast manager at the time. And it was just so weird. We were sitting there and they said Outcast won, and they started booming. And I'm like, hold up, wait a minute now. How, how you, we been suing y'all all I'm of like, this how long? How y'all go boo us? But what I realized is I felt like they weren't necessarily booing Outcast. They were booing the fact that a New York that artist didn't did, win, yeah, didn't win Best yeah, New Artist. So yeah. it was cool, but, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the South got something to say. Dre uttered those infamous words, and the rest was history. And, you know, Outcast ended up, you know, I think becoming one of the greatest hip-hop hip groups of all time. I'm a big Tribe Called Quest fan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Andre, you know, Three Stacks talks a lot about the influences, mm -hmm. you know, of Tribe and, and what they, the impact they had on Outkast. So we always supported, like I said, other, you know, genres of hip hop, if you will, or different areas. But it was interesting to see how it took a while for it to catch on. But then once Outkast came, then Goody Mob came. And then you had, you know, um, Ludacris. 
Yep. The homie who we loved, who Home spent team. a lot of time with us. Shout out to, you know, Jeff and Shaka and Aisha and everybody over there at DTP. I was actually, along with some other people, me, JD, and a couple other people, one of the first ones that ever wanted to sign Luda in Atlanta. True story, I still have a contract at my house that says Shoestring Productions and mm. Ludacris. But the way it was going to go down was he was going to wow. sign to my production company, but I needed to have my deal through LaFace Records. So... It didn't happen, but, you know, everything happened the way it was supposed to. I'm super proud of him. He went on to be the superstar yeah. musician yep. and actor that he is now, but and, and I couldn't be more proud. But, yeah, I was in these streets, to say I, the least. I, I know it. And so that that brings me the question of, like, listen, man, you well-versed, travel everywhere, been everywhere, but what would you say would be the top three experiences that you've taken from the previous life work that really has helped propel you into what you do now with the philanthropy side? Wow, the top three experiences, most fun or just like pivotal moments, you think? Just, mo yeah, a pivotal moment to where it really, really helped direct you where, what you need to do moving forward. Okay, so one thing was actually when I first, when I was in college, I'll say this much, because I told you I was interning, but I was going to a lot of music conventions. You know, there was a ton of music conventions back in the early 90s that would help a lot of upcoming musicians and executives. I remember going to um, Jack the Rapper in Atlanta, and I saw Russell Simmons in the lobby. You know, the lobby is always the place where everybody hang out. That's where you the congregate. Convention. Yes, you know, a network. And so we were in the lobby, and I saw Russell, and I went up to him, and I was like, yo, you don't know me, but by the end of the conference, you will. And he kind of looked at me, and he was like, what is this little girl talking about? But he, he was friendly, and I said, so you just watch. So fast forward, I went to all the panels, and I was the kid that was, like, not afraid to raise my hand and ask questions and all that. By the end of the conference, just so happened as fate would have it, I ran back into him. And he said, yo, I just want to tell you, I seen you doing your thing. He said, stay at it. He said, you, you going to do something in this business. And that stayed with me forever. Mm. And it never... Um, like, I, I was never afraid to walk in a room and either ask for my record to get played or to go in and negotiate a higher salary for myself. You know, because women and in music, tough, just so. like in sports, you know, female executives in sports, I'm sure have to negotiate their salaries. And so once I got past the VP level, I knew I needed to get an attorney. And so I went and, you know, but always fought for what I felt like I deserved. So I was never afraid of that. So that was the first thing. I think the second thing... Oh, let me see. Um, so this was, it was pivotal. It wasn't necessarily a good thing, but when I left, when L.A. and Babyface sold the company in 2000, L.A. moved to New York City to replace Clive Davis to work at Arista Records. I followed him up there, but it was a real toxic environment for me. And I had a new boss that I was reporting to. They were yelling all the time. He was very condescending, and I felt like I was getting overlooked. And I started experiencing anxiety for the first time. And that's the first time that I ever uttered the words, maybe I should just kill myself. I didn't really mean it, but I was hurting. Mm. And so I went and saw a therapist and got the help that I needed. And I also quit the, that job. That was the, cause, and I never grew up wanting to be a quitter. You know, I always went hard for what I believed in. But that was the first time that I, realized I had to stand up for myself no matter how tough it was. Now, negotiating a salary is one thing, but when you really feel like your back is up against the wall and you have nobody really supporting you and it starts affecting your health, you really got to muster up the courage and strength to be able to walk away from a situation. Mm -hmm. So that was a pivotal moment for me to walk away. I ended up coming back home, sleeping on my friend's couch in Atlanta because I had moved to New York. Mm -hmm. Three months later, Jermaine Dupri text me, he's like, okay, homie, what you doing? Like, you, you can't just stay on your friend's couch like the whole summer. Like, you can't just walk away from this music thing. You don't put too much in it. He got me an interview with the chairman of Sony Music, I mean, of Columbia Records at the time, which is where his deal was, his social death deal. Mm -hmm. I got VP stripes nice. out that the gate. That was the executive, nice. executive position at that time. Almost double my salary. Like, you know, God is good. And so, you know, just being able to stand up for myself. So those three moments just really taught me to, like, believe in Shanti um, and to let my work speak for itself. So with all that success, 
how did you say, or what was the point where you say, you know what, I'm this executive in the music industry, but I want to pursue my passion with Silence the Shame? Wow. So it's a few things I need to speak on that before I got to that. So that was a, when I went to Columbia, that was around 2002. So I stayed in the Columbia system, got promoted to senior vice president. And then in 2004, 2005, I moved over to Universal Motown Records working for Sylvia Rome as executive vice president, making almost a half a million dollars a year. Never seen that kind of money in my life, traveling the world. And that situation, I started feeling like I was slipping away and losing a little bit of myself. I wasn't eating. I was traveling all the time. Like, I might catch a flight to L.A., come back the next night, jump on another plane and go somewhere else. Like, I was always on the road, wasn't eating, wasn't sleeping. My mom had started to develop Alzheimer's. My uncle passed away who helped to raise me because one thing I didn't mention is my, my father died by suicide when I was a child. So that was kind of like my first entree into mental health um, growing up. And so it just got to a point where, like, the money, the lifestyle, the music, it had just, it was, um, it was crippling for me in a way. Mm -hmm. And so I wore the mask a lot because I felt like I was fronting so that yeah. people would think I was happy, mm -hmm. right? So what life was like for me behind the mask was a young lady that was in a lot of pain. And I was dealing with anxiety. I was dealing with depression. I didn't really know what to call it, though, because we talk in 2009 when people weren't really talking about mental yeah. health. It yeah. wasn't a thing. Self-care wasn't a thing. It was really more hashtag team no sleep. You know, yeah. the more you work, the more you were celebrated, yeah. right? <laughs> Don't try, hey, own I'm, up to it I'm, now. Yeah. So for me, you know, that's when I had to take a hard look at my life. And then I remember um, one day I was riding uptown in a taxi going up to Harlem work and my entire right side went numb no lie from my head to my toe I could not feel the side of my body of course it freaked me out so I went and had all these MRIs and tests done I got diagnosed with what's called cervical spinal stenosis which is where like the fluid wasn't properly getting to some of the vertebrae in my neck and it was causing a lot of tingling and numbness and a lot of other issues and my doctor was like yo you in your 30s this is something people get diagnosed with in their 60s but it was a direct result of stress I was just wearing my body into the ground. So That's I, crazy. I, Stress can do that. Yeah. So I quit and walked away, you know, after, um, you know, a lot of contemplation. But I talked to my sister and my family, and they were like, you need to just come back to the crib. So that's when I moved back to Atlanta in 2010. But right before I came back to Atlanta is when I felt like God kind of placed this little vision of service in my spirit. Because, I, I mean, I've always donated and tried to support, but I was working all the time. I didn't have a lot of time to give to the community. So I was online one night looking through um, CNN.com and noticed that the city of Detroit had lost all of its funding for the city and state morgues. They had bodies backed up. I know it sounds morbid, but this is a true story. They had bodies backed up like shoes in a closet. So I literally stayed at the office for three hours at night and had my friends in the industry start making donations. So I got like Akon, Busta Rhymes. I got Kid Rock involved because I reached out to his label. I raised $30,000 and buried 30 people in like a matter of a few weeks in Detroit wow. just to do something different. And I was like, whoa, if I can do this, imagine imagine what I can do. So that's when I came back to the A and started doing homeless feedings out of the trunk of my car and all this stuff. And then in 2014, my best friend took her own life after I had been back a few years. I talked to the day before it happened. So I went into a downward spiral, and that next year is a year that I actually contemplated taking my own life in 2015. So I know that was a lot in between, but I had to tell that story to get to it because I went through a lot of ups and downs, and walking away from, you know, my dream job was really tough on me. But I felt like God was just calling me in a different direction. But now I get to still work with music and sports, which is kind of cool, and, and do this work that I love in mental health. Yeah, and that was the thing I saw. I thought it was key, you know, when you were going through that, you reached out to your pastor, mm -hmm. um, who, which is now Senator oh, Warnock. our senator, yeah. Raphael Warnock. And uh, he prayed for you. And then also just made it a reminder to you, you got to talk to somebody and get some help. And that eventually snowballed into Silence to Shame. It did. Yeah? It did. I mean, wow. Like, 
So before I talked to Pastor, I called my sister and she said, you need to call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline because I was still in crisis, as they call it. So that number is 1-800-273-TALK. And then that's when I tax- texted Pastor. So I got the help that I needed. And I was doing a radio interview on V103 with uh, Ryan Cameron, who used to be on that station. And we were just talking and I was like, yeah, you know, I don't know what the problem is. There ain't nothing to really be ashamed about. People just need to silence the shame. And it just kind of rolled off my tongue. And of course, mm. the marketing person in me was like, hold up. Oh. Hey, <laughs> got some here. Let me pull that oh, up. Keep it right here. Yeah. And so I, we made t-shirts. Nick Cannon was like our first ambassador. We launched in 2016. And then in 2017, I said, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which we're in now. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm just going to make up my own day. I'm going to make May 5th National Silence of Shame Day. And I know it's Cinco de Mayo, but y'all can still talk about mental health before you take your little shots. <laughs> we're going to make y'all talk about some serious stuff. And so, you know, we got the support of different artists and celebrities I worked with, actors, entertainers, and we got 90 million impressions in one day. People talking about mental health on social media. Again, before the pandemic, you know, before it was a thing. And so I was like, I need to do something with this. So the next year I formed the 501c3 and now we do community conversations. We also have a podcast. Um, Excuse me, we do workplace wellness trainings of trying to tell people how to identify signs and symptoms of mental illness. Because I tell everybody, we all have mental health. We don't Mm. all have a mental illness. But, you know, you wake up every day and you're able to do your job and, you know, care for your families. That's your mental wellness, right? We all have that. But what you have to do is protect it and nurture it. And so that's what we teach a lot about that. We teach a lot about suicide prevention. Shout out to the NFL Players Association. Stepping up In to 2020, the plate. Yeah. we were the NFL PA charitable partner. Nice. So we received a grant from them. I've spoken and shared my personal story at major companies. So I speak on the side because you've got to supplement that income. Mm-hmm. But I've spoken at the NBA office. I've spoken for EA Sports. Reebok, HBO, Def Jam Records, you name it. And so I'm grateful, you know, that people wanted to hear my story and I've been able to, you know, hopefully impact the lives of others. And more importantly, Silence of Shame is actually, we're doing the work. We're a small grassroots organization, but we are really moving the needle in communities of color. And as we've seen from the pandemic, you know, African-Americans and black people were disproportionately affected, you know, from COVID-19 and then so many other things. And so... The pandemic with our children, it just exacerbated the anxiety, the suicidal ideation. And so we're just trying to continue to educate the community so they can actually, like, we don't have therapists, but we push people to the resources, right? Right. We have a ton of psychologists and psychiatrists that we work with. So anytime you pull up a piece of content, you're going to see a Dr. Ayana Abrams or Spirit or Dr. Grant, you know, who's a a race expert in L.A. Because we're trying to bring all these experts to the community so we can educate you know, especially for communities of color. We, we serve the community at large, but our primary demographic is communities of color. And so on May 5th, before we take that shot, we're going to be toasting to the initiatives. Yes. For National Silence of Shame Day. It's a, mm-hmm. a national text-a-thon that we do. So, okay. you know, you can pull out your phone. and Just like, remember how back in the day they had the telethons, yeah. right, with Jerry Lewis? We're doing the Silence of Shame text-a-thon. So all you get to do is pull out your phone, text the word SILENCE to 707070. If you're in Atlanta, we're going to be at the gathering spot all day. So we're asking people to just pop in with us. Um, young lady Colony Reeves, who's on Selling Tampa, is going to be there with us. Um, and it's just going to be good. And then we got our gala coming up on May 14th that we're doing here in Atlanta. We're honoring Chris Hubbard, NFL uh, one of our player. One NFL brothers. Yes, yeah. one of the... NFL brethren, and so uh, we're excited about that. And he um, has a really great foundation, and he does a lot of mental health advocacy work. So it's going to be good. You know, we're just keeping this thing going. We're trying to do our part. And more importantly, though, we're trying to save lives. Definitely. On a serious note. You know, I've seen a lot of athletes, no matter what nationality or background you're from, in recent years that are, you know, being open about publicly hurting and going through things and we've seen some of them take their own lives and so and for me for for my father to have died by suicide and my best friend and for me to seriously have contemplated it you know I want people to know it's nothing to be embarrassed about but we we also want you to know that suicide shouldn't be an option although I know sometimes it is when some people are hurting but we're just trying to educate people and push them to the resources so that they can live their best lives and silence of shame also sort of resolution to designate May 1st as 
Black Children's Mental Health Awareness Day yes. in the state of Georgia. Yes, it's so the first. What led you to that movement? So I can't take credit for that. Uh, my ex executive director, Jewel Gooding, who is this amazing sister, um, she comes to us from Mental Health America of Georgia. And she's been doing, she used to be a clinician and she also, um, you know, worked with a lot of youth mm -hmm. um, in underserved communities. And she was like, we need to also do something that really, because there's a children's mental health day, right? At yep. the state capitol. But we need to focus on our black kids who are really hurting. Dude. And we see the suicide rates going up. And so... One of our uh, board chairs, Ms. Deanna Hamilton, uh, our vice chair of our board, connected us to Senator Anderson. You know, we pitched the organization to them and told them what we had going on and talked about the resolution. And Governor Kemp signed it in, you know, signed the resolution. And May 1st from now on is Black Children's Mental Health Day in the state of Georgia. And now we're really excited Salute. about that. Salute. Thank you. Salute. Toast to that. Yes, indeed. Yes, cheers. Yes, indeed. Nice thank you, thank you. So... Um, I am uh, trying to get that done in other states. We're talking to California now, hopefully going to take it to New York, of course, because New York does a lot around mental health and wellness. And then we want to take it to the federal level, mm. you know, after that. So we have a lot of great stuff going on and, you know, some partnerships we're going to be announcing in the coming months. We, we're just trying to do the best that we can and move the needle. It's a lot of great organizations out there, but... Um, we're just excited about the work that we're doing. We like that little engine that could. So we're we trying to, you know, hopefully get some of this Twitter money. Somebody yeah. drop some millions, billions drop on the little organization. Over there. You know, billions over Shaq, there. where you at? Bezos, <laughs> where you at? <laughs> Oprah, where you at? Yeah. Harry and Megan, where you at? I don't know. Hey, you, you, you know what, though? It's... Uh... And you've been doing the work, though. Yeah, and like, that's the thing. you see oh, me jumping off of planes for the last six, seven years. For real. Like, no I, lie. I see it. From the smallest event to, to the, the breakfast club. To the breakfast club. Yeah. Like, right. huge. Relentless. You relentless, And, and it's man. like, I felt like, I said, you know what? I'm going to market this thing like I'm marketing outcast. Yeah. How yeah. I break a record, I'm going to break a nonprofit. And you Hard work. Oh, my goodness. But, the, but I humbly say that because... One of the things I learned in service, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about the people. And it's about the community. So if you're going to commit to it, you really got to commit to it. Because it's all some people got. The opportunity to hear somebody say, I thought about taking my own life, but no, there's a better way. Or I'm going to provide this resource to you. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't play. This ain't no, you know what I'm saying? I can't play with you. This is somebody's life. Yeah. So yeah. I took it very serious when God gave me the ability to get myself together. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to still be okay. And now, again, he has blessed me to be able to speak at all these big companies and go back into music and still do more in sports than I ever did, you know, when I was in the music business. And, you know, I've spoken, and I remember getting a call, like, in 2018 from this conference in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and they were like, oh, we want you to come talk to this, talk at this hip-hop conference. So I'm thinking, okay, they want to hear about my outcast stories and all that. And they were like, no, actually... We heard about Silence of Shame. We want you to do that. And then the next year, I got invited to the mental health conference in Europe in Belfast, Ireland. I was the only woman of color to give a keynote awesome. in Ireland. Killing it. So love I'm it. I'm, I'm, I'm so Dream. grateful. And I love it. I really love it. I think I finally found my purpose. It's purpose-driven work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm still passionate about music. I'm passionate about sports. But to be able to marry the two is just a blessing. One of the things I... I've heard you talk about, but I haven't really heard you go into detail is, you know, the intersection of like sports and entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we deal with is after we're done, it's really like the actions are shown more. It comes off as we done with you. You, you, you have no purpose. Mm -hmm. You, you like, who, what's your name again? Like, that's what it feels yeah. like. Oh, you yeah. used to play. Oh, yeah, yeah you yeah. used to play. And so I saw one of the comments you you said, you talked about, it's hard for creatives, entertainers, to be able to come out and acknowledge, man, I'm bothered. 100%. Like, I got something wrong. And I see it's it's, it's a it's the same as it my is. point that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much making. And especially if you're an artist, to your point, that maybe hadn't put out music in a while, right? Mm. Which I will say some artists, like, can still tour, right, who were popular in the 80s and 90s because, like, old school, old school is still cool and in. 
but it still isn't a, an easy road all the time, right? And that's why I respect what the Professional Athletes Foundation does, the foundation arm of NFLPA. Shout out to Leslie and Carl Francis and, and my folks over there, because they try to make sure that they keep these young men, you know, out and being able to do stuff in the community. So, like, you know, we've done stuff with Muhammad Masakwa, you know, Garrison Hurst on our panels, War Dunn, who already does a lot in the community. But my point is we still try to bring a lot of these former players back into the fold mm -hmm. so they can share their stories and we can, you know, highlight what they're doing and uplift them. And the same with, you know, musicians. Like, it, it takes a certain mental toughness we know to be an athlete on the field or to be an artist on that stage. Mm. But nobody talks about what's it like behind the mask when you get off the stage or when you come off the field, Right. right? So we've got to get them to be more comfortable with taking that mask off and sharing. And that's why I'm happy to see more musicians and athletes coming to the table. And one thing I was on a panel talking with Mr. Jerry Sandusky, who is the voice of the Baltimore Ravens. And, you know, we were just openly talking about what are some, you know, practical things that we can do and implement, whether it's in sports or music. And I was like, you know, when these athletes get signed, no matter what type of athlete you are, you know, you got your attorney, you got your agent. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all have a separate manager. You yep. might have a publicist. Oh, you might sign yeah. to a marketing agency. Mm -hmm. Where's the therapist? Where's the life coach? You know, where's the meditation instructor? Where is your starting five that's your wellness team? Mm -hmm. That's just as important as the accountant. Because guess what? And I'll say this, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but but if you fucked up and you can't think right, right, and you you in your feelings all the time, you can't think straight, your money going to be funny. Mm. Your work you do on the field is going to be funny. Your relationship with your family is not going to be right. It all starts in the mind. And it's not just the mental toughness on the field. It's understanding how to take care of yourself on a daily basis, right? Waking up in the morning and setting your intentions before you go to practice, before you get that morning workout in. Start your place from a place, start your morning rather from a place of peace where you can really center yourself. But you might need a yoga instructor for that. In addition to your trainer that's gonna come get your weight workout in. Right. You gotta get your mind, body, and your spirit right. right. Period. So right. y'all need to make sure that, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's the agents or whatever, like I would love to see Silence and Shame partner and do different programs and talk to these artists when they first get signed to the labels. Cause a lot of these young rappers, you know, you might be an overnight sensation and you getting a $100,000 deal or, you know, a million dollars. What you gonna do with that money? And you haven't even matured and you don't even know how to handle yourself. Or you might out here be out here, you know, going through it and stressed out again behind the mask and you might, you know, partake in some stuff that's messing with your mind, but you're using it as an unhealthy coping mechanism. I'm not the fun police. I'm not saying you can't drink, you can't turn up. But sometimes people turn up and it's affecting their livelihood. Right. But if you have the right people in place, just like your regular doctors, you might need a psychiatrist. You might need a therapist. You might need a life coach. But they all need to be working in tandem mm. so See, they can get you right. And that's key. That, that's key because... And that's going to get to your pockets. That's going to keep that money rolling. Too, and, that's, and your family life. These and are the being, being able to be a father and fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Listen, I could do this all day. That's a fact. It's a lot that goes on behind the mask. I wore the. I still wear the mask. I'm still fucked up because of, I lost my sister unexpectedly three years ago. I lost my mother in January. I still have days that I don't want to get out of bed. And that's facts. But the difference is I talk about it. I have a therapist that I see every bi-weekly every other week. You know, I have friends that know that I might not be having a good day. So I got a good support system. I have accountability partners. Yeah. Athletes need, you know, what I, somebody might take my idea, but what I said to Jerry <laughs> that we need <laughs> is that just like, you know, you have big brothers, big sisters, like that mentoring program, yeah. mm -hmm. you need big brothers, big sisters in the NFL, mm -hmm. in the NBA, so that you are a big brother to Solomon, Tal Solomon Thomas. Mm -hmm. Solomon Thomas, Touch. shout out to Solomon, who's just on the panel with me. You know what I'm saying? A current player and a former player. Yeah. And y'all rock with each other hard. You can't take on two and three different players. Get, just get you one player. Yeah. One current, yeah. one former, and y'all rock with each other, and y'all be accountability partners. Mm. But we all need to train up and come up together, and you got to, like, keep looking out for one another. And I think the, young the, the young guys right. can help keep, you know, 
you sparked and excited and then y'all can pour into them. But from a mental health perspective as well. And keep them, you know, keep them on their game. So how, how would... Pun intended. How would you... <laughs> definitely. How would you... All the way. So for, for us, like... April going into May is when guys get drafted. Yep. They, they sign into the NFL. Yep. I've done and some talks for a friend of mine who, you know, is an attorney for a lot of up-and-coming guys going into the draft. Yeah. And similar to, like, I guess uh, an artist signing a record deal. Yep. It's a new life, a Correct. new lifestyle. 100%. So how would you tell these up-and-coming athletes, entertainers to navigate that space coming into that new lifestyle. Again, that's what I'm saying. It, it really is, it will behoove, <clears throat> excuse me, the parents and the agents and the teams to come together so we can do some trainings, right? Mm. Some different sessions for these guys so that they really understand. I can't give away my whole idea. Because yeah, nah, there's some nah. things that I'm working on. But, <clears throat> but my point is, it needs to be some sort of formal trainings put together in sessions that are had, you know, before you go in and record the album or before you hit the field, you know, your rookie year. Like, cause, and I know that, and I will say this, I know the NBA and I'm sure the NFL, they do like um, rookie yeah, yeah. symposiums and boot camps and stuff like that. But I just want to make sure we're incorporating more from a wellness perspective and just adding that to all the other great stuff mm. that's already set up for these young guys before they get out there. Because, yeah. again, if your mind ain't right, none of, nothing else is going to be right. And we've seen athletes in recent years either literally just walk away from a, a championship, right, or take a few games off. We're seeing a lot more of that now where they're being vocal about it, which is good. But let's try to put some things in place so that before they even start and go into those high-profile positions like music and sports, right, or acting, that there's some things put in place that the money guys actually care about you, and it's not just about the money. Yeah. And that's the hard thing, is being able to create an environment to where it's okay oh, to yeah. talk about yeah. it. And, and I there feel might like be individual sessions, because I know it's a lot of stigma that's still out there, to your point, you know, mm. but let's do some one-on-one stuff. That's why I think even if you did accountability partners from a wellness perspective, right, mm -hmm. That you had somebody like, yo, dude, like you see, you go to therapy this week, or you good? Have you talked? Yeah. You need to talk to like whatever it is. You you need to work out, or we can do some yoga together, or we can just go hiking together, or whatever. Yeah. Just to talk and get it out and clear your head. You know, we see a lot of work going on in the barbershops. Shout out to this organization called the Confess Project. You know, they do a lot of talks in the barbershops. So we see how men and the camaraderie is there, and people are starting to open up, even women in, in beauty shops. But you need to do something a little bit more on an ongoing basis. That's all I was saying. The buddy system or accountability partners could really go a long way if you had the PAF, you know, and current, you know, organizations or teams do something together. I think one of the things that we talk about is how important it is for men to embrace mental health and, for sure. and everything. But from your perspective, is it more prevalent with women embracing what they're going through mentally? would say so. I don't know the direct statistics, although I do think that we're seeing, you know, people kind of um, pull the mask off, if you will, right? F from a male perspective, a lot more men are opening up and seem to be more comfortable to talk about it. But I don't know what it's like in those locker rooms, right? I don't know what it's like sometimes late night in the, in the recording studio when there's no women that are there. So I'm sure some of that still exists. So we, we're getting there, but we got a long way to go. Um, but I do respect the fact that athletes like DeMar DeRozan and, you know, Jermaine Jones, former NBA player, mm. or, again, Solomon um, and, and um, Chris Hubbard, those guys are opening up and doing a lot more and, and becoming advocates around mental health and wellness. And even like Dak Prescott, you know, who made his, his brother rest in peace, mm. you know, who died by suicide, he talked openly about it. And shout out to the NFL because I saw, you know, Roger Goodell and his team, they did a lot. I saw a lot of commercials, like organizations like the Trevor Project. How mm -hmm. that silence is shame, Roger. We like to work with y'all too. But I saw them you doing more, Roger. you know, so I think it's starting to come, right? Mm -hmm. And you see a lot more happen. Even like I've done stuff with the NCAA and been on panels and, and I see that they're trying to do more. But again, you know, the resources just don't meet the needs right now. And it's so much more to be done, so much more education um, and you can't just do stuff in the month of May, right? Or once or twice a year. It's gotta be, it's gotta be built into the culture 
and mm-hmm. the fabric of the NFL or the culture and the fabric of these record companies. So that it's something, you know, either once a month or again or on an ongoing basis or the buddy system, whatever we're talking about, that they feel like, okay, this is just isn't just a one off, right? This isn't just a PR stunt. Right. This is just something, to check off the box. Right? Yeah. And yeah. and from what we've seen with the pandemic, I don't care who you are, kids, adolescents, you know, we're all going through a lot right now. We don't know what the ramifications of this pandemic are going to be like for the next five to ten years. So mm. we got to take this thing seriously um, and really get the help that we need. And also we need to bring up, like, all these athletes and entertainers that have young kids, you know, let them know that psychiatry and psychology are viable career options, right? Because even especially in the black community, like, it's like 5% of all clinicians are black. And that's not to say you have to see someone that looks like you, but in some cultures it works better for others. Yeah, it um, helps. So we want to see more people actually going to school and, you know, choosing that as a career choice so that if everybody, if we do erase the stigma and everybody wants to get help, we actually got the help, yeah. right? And we, yeah. we have the resources in the community to meet the need. So I, I remember one thing, and I, I want to ask you this before we let you go. Before, well, pre-pandemic, you were offering... Silence to shame, eight-hour course mandates, or not not a mandate, but you were offering courses. So we did mental health first aid trainings. It was like yeah. an eight-hour class. Yeah, eight-hour class, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually, shout out to National Council in D.C. They're the organization that is responsible for what's called mental health first aid trainings. And mm-hmm. so we still administer those trainings. Those are great trainings. Just like you take a CPR class or something else or continuing education class, I would encourage anybody that's, you know, um, able to do it and take the time out of their day. It's only like $35, but a lot of organizations like will offer it for free. Like we offer it for free um, from some of the grant support that we have. And so that's a really great thing to do. Also in September um, is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And you don't have to just take it in September. It's called uh, QPR training, um, which is question, persuade, response. And so it teaches you all about suicide prevention. So it's a lot of different courses that are available. One thing that we are proud of, we formed a partnership with Sony Music Publishing and we um, established what's called the Soundtrack of Mental Health, which are 60-minute wellness trainings about Mm -hmm. self-care, understanding mental health, excuse me, maternal mental health. And we offer these trainings to employees of Sony or to any artists in the music industry for free. So I want to take that actually into sports and partner with another sports organization. And then I want to take it into film. I've already got the branding for it. Well, girl, go ahead and bring it on over. So we're just fine. So like Sony was our big partner and they gave us, you know, a, a, a nice grant to be able to do it. So we just need an organization within sports to come and allow us to do it. And then we can train the employees at the companies as well as, you know, the athletes. Love that integration yeah, right there. Doing it. Doing it well. Yeah, so, you know, again, we, we just out here trying to do our part. But we uh, on, a, on a serious note and a humble note, we are still a grassroots organization, so we still do need the support. And I'm just praying that, you know, that somebody going, you know, drop a couple million on us and, and allow us to grow. Because you're out here doing the work. Because we, we, you know, as more people want us to support them and do it, we need staff, you know, we need mm-hmm. the resources. Because um, people think... Nonprofit, but you also, it's still a business, right? Yeah, so you still absolutely. have to pay employees to work. You got payroll and everything else, like a normal business. And so it's it's harder to, it's easier to raise funds when you're like a VC, you know, you have a company and a, or you're going to a VC to raise money and capital with you because there's going to be a real ROI. You can tangibly see that see. money you get back. It's goodwill. The ROI is the warm and fuzzies yeah. and saving lives. That's mm-hmm. your return on your investment. But so where, where can our audience find... Uh, Silence the Shame. So you can visit our website at www.silencetheshame.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Silence the Shame, on Facebook and Twitter at Silence TH Shame, because the name was taken. And also on our YouTube page, we have a lot of really good content, like different community conversations that we've done that are recorded, some really great information. Um, or you can text the word silence to 707070. Um, if you want to donate. And if you're in crisis, like there's this other organization called the Crisis Text Line Organization. So say if you got somebody who's really going through it and it's three o'clock in the morning, too late to call their therapist, you can text the word silence to 
741 and text with a crisis counselor. Now, it's not therapy, but it's a crisis counselor that they're trained to de-escalate a crisis. So just know you're never alone. You gotcha. can text set silence to 741741. If you're going through it in the middle of the night, you just need somebody to talk to, use it. They're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's confidential. It's free. So we're just pushing people to the resources. Well, Shoe Strings, we appreciate you stopping by, man. Thank you. Dropping all of these gems on us. Going behind the mask. You really took us behind the yeah, mask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, t- I tell you, I, I put my mask on and I take it off, you know, every day. Yeah, man. And it's, we on, it's on and off every day. And, and, and what we going to do, we going to make sure we push this thing out good. I we just happen to take you. it off today. Absolutely. And see, can we get some meals already donated in the form of grants? Yes, sir. And we need some shame. unrestricted funds, too, because that's how we're able to hire. Absolutely. So grant money, we want to keep that coming in so we can do all our programs, but we need staff <laughs> to be mm. able to, to do the program. So unrestricted would be great, too. That would be great. Holla at you, girl. Holla, holla. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Salute. man. To Queens. There it is. ATL. Shouty. <laughs> ATL. The old Atlanta. That's right. <laughs> the pride of Benjamin Mays. You know, I was Miss 10th grade and homecoming queen. I was most popular in high school. Hey. Until Diddy pulled up. Behind the mask.